Leaving Russia is a story of growing up Jewish in what used to be the Soviet Union. It's an analysis of dual or double identity in the sense that it's uh, an attempt to get to the root of what it was like to be both at home and not at home in Russia in the Soviet Union in a place where my ancestors had been living for generations where my great-grandparents are buried in, and where my parents were born and felt that they had a claim to that country's destiny. In other words, an attempt to understand how Jews in the Soviet Union felt both, both uh, accepted and not accepted, both within and without the mainstream. It is also a story of uh, a young person's coming of age during the last decades of the Soviet Union. In other words, it is also an attempt at a kind of uh, at a kind of uh, anemnesis, at a kind of uh, uh, um, at making sense of what it was like to grow up on the brink of the country's collapse. Uh, and it is also a story which um, I think captures various aspects of uh, the Brezhnevite and then the Andropovite uh, Soviet Union. So we're talking about the 1970s and 80s. Uh, there is a section which deals with travel. I traveled extensively, first with my father, who was and who is a writer and a medical scientist, and then alone. And I got to go to places where I learned a whole lot about the country's ethnic makeup and the, particularly the ethnic conflict on the brink of the country's uh, decomposition, especially in the Caucasus, uh, where I spent part of the summer of 1986. Uh, finally, I hope this comes across uh, as you read the book. Uh, it is also a love story, perhaps fragmented, but a love story, a story of unrequited love, uh, a story of loving Russia and of not being loved back. Leaving Russia a Jewish story. This, the subtitle, I think, uh, contains a double entendre, which is deliberate, and it suggests two things simultaneously. On the one hand, it's a story of growing up in Russia and attempting to emigrate from Russia. And in that sense, it is a Jewish story because the main character, his family, and the whole community of Jewish refuseniks are Jews attempting to leave Russia. But I think, perhaps on a slightly more subtle level, it also suggests that the very history of Jews in Russia, which goes back a couple of centuries, really uh, Russia hadn't gained its Jewish population until the partitions of Poland. So we're talking about late 18th uh, early 19th century. But from the very beginning, uh, as the subtitle suggests, I hope, living in Russia for Jews was also leaving Russia in various ways, be it through uh, thinking about getting out, thinking about getting one's children out, or be it through uh, various attempts to leave like the outflux of Jews in the 1880s and the 1900s following the pogroms, and of course, the great emigration of Soviet Jews in the 1970s and 80s. Well, of course, uh, the refusing experience in some ways is at the center of the book's action and at the story I'm uh, weaving together. I was uh, nine when my parents uh, decided to emigrate, to leave for good. Uh, of course, it was an attempt at exodus that failed. We became refuseniks and was stuck in there, living in a kind of limbo, uh, disenfranchised. Uh, my parents were persecuted. And I lived that way for throughout the very formative years of my life, uh, pre-teens, uh, teens, uh, high school, and then the first several years uh, as a university student. So in that sense, I was formed by the years uh, that we spent as refusenik, and my vision, I think my mental makeup in many ways is a product of that refusenik experience. It's an interesting question, and in fact, uh, I've been asked how uh, my memoirs, both 
Waiting for America, which has been published in Russian translation and uh, is in print in Moscow and leaving Russia, which uh, uh, has not been translated into Russian, but I hope it will be. I've been asked how these books uh, could be, you know, uh, useful to the current generation of young people who are obviously uh, disenchanted with the regime and uh, who are contemplating uh, leaving while the borders are still open. Uh, of course, uh, we have to uh, be very careful not to think of uh, differences as similarities. Uh, <laughs> when uh, we were refusing it, the main question was to be able to leave. Uh, uh, and that's, uh, that's uh, the difference for the current generation it's very hard to explain to today's, you know, 18-year-olds in Russia when I go there that uh, the, the challenge is not to find a place to go to. The challenge is physically, literally being able to leave, being allowed to leave. Today, uh, they can get on the plane from Russia and easily travel. So, of course, uh, uh, some of the terms are not the same. But I do think, nevertheless, that the... Uh, this um, sentiment that the current young generation experiences today, where they feel that the country is on the brink of something, where they feel that uh, it's becoming a dictatorship, right wing or left wing, they're still not sure, but they all sense it. And that emigration has traditionally been one of the ways in which uh, Russians, East Europeans, Soviets have dealt with the situation if they could. Uh, in other words, we're not uh, dissidents. We're not trying to uh, improve things from within. We're just going to leave. So in that sense, I do think that there is something for the younger generation to learn from in the book, because I think those anxieties of growing up both Jewish and Russian, those anxieties of feeling at home and not at home, those anxieties of uh, knowing that uh, the ultimate goal of our family and of other refusing families is to leave, and yet being so conscious of the fact that we're leaving a home, we're leaving a place where uh, generations of our ancestors had been living. I think something like that is still uh, a condition that today's younger generation could probably learn from. Because when uh, I go to Russia and I'm asked this question, what I hear is that, uh, and I didn't hear that 10 years ago, but I do hear it now in uh, the present day Russia, is that the young people, uh, and I'm talking about the way I was in the book, uh, uh, the book ends with leaving Russia in, on June 7th, 1997. I'm 20. So people who are at, in college, uh, that for them, for the first time, the prospect of emigration is not just a historical reference. It's a real possibility. Growing up in a literary family and uh, gaining, I suppose, a literary voice uh, is an important part of the story that I told that I reconstructed in leaving Russia. My father is a writer, and when I was still a young child, he was uh, a member of the Union of Soviet Writers, so I guess in some sense an official writer. And uh, he taught me many things about writing very early on, including he taught me the craft of poetry and versification. So I learned those things very early on. I also got to experience uh, the life of uh, uh, official writers and some of the privileges that they were accorded. Uh, when we became refuseniks, uh, my father was expelled. Several of his books were destroyed. Uh, li literally, the galleys were broken. And in fact, I remember as an eight-year-old admiring illustrations uh, that had been commissioned to uh, accompany a novel of his, and all of that was literally destroyed when we became refuseniks. So when, as a young man, I began to write poetry seriously, and that happened quite late. Uh, in fact, it was something atypical for uh, sort of young Soviet uh, boys and girls growing up in literary families. I really, uh, I think I wrote some very excellent poems at the age of eight, and then I didn't start until the age of uh, almost 19. So it's kind of interesting. So when I started writing poetry seriously, we were 
going through some of the hardest years as refuseniks. And uh, um, my father, I think, of course, he was my mentor and my teacher, but he also wanted me to get out of that underground-like existence. He wanted me to attempt to participate in the literary mainstream because he had been deprived of that for so many years and where he had publications, they were abroad or sometimes something of his was reprinted and he would show up at a publishing house to collect a honorarium and they would say, oh, but we thought you were dead. Uh, in other words, editors had been brainwashed into believing that he actually had emigrated or was dead. So in other words, for me, trying to break into the mainstream meant a whole lot because uh, not only of uh, what I was trying to do as a young writer, but also because of my family's experience, because it meant somehow coming out of a cultural ghetto, coming out of this underground. And so uh, I did seek uh, to publish my early poems. Uh, and uh, ironically, uh, these efforts uh, began to succeed the late, in the late spring of 1987, just as we uh, were given permission to emigrate. And in fact, I heard of the first publication of uh, several of my poems in a leading Moscow daily, Moskovsky Komsomolets, uh, when I was already in Italy in the summer of 1987. So there could have been others that I'm not aware of, but it really doesn't matter. What does matter is that I think despite the fact that uh, I was sort of uh, uh, trying to break, you know, the wall with my head, I was uh, really uh, experiencing the kinds of structural barriers that were in place in the Soviet cultural institutions. You show up in an editorial office, uh, you look Jewish, you have a Jewish patronymic. It's obvious to some of the editors that you, you know, you don't qualify, but still it's thrilling to try. And I do remember uh, the thrill of trying, partly uh, colored not only by the fact that I wanted them published, but also because I felt that for a refusenik youth to have some poems published in the Soviet mainstream meant challenging the system in various ways. It's a fascinating question, and one I have dealt with uh, in this book, but also I think in Waiting for America and elsewhere, the question of uh, how much uh, I am still a product of my Soviet upbringing and of those years as a Soviet child, uh, a Soviet raw youth. Uh, and I'm not sure uh, I, have, uh, I have all the answers, but I think some of the answers are in the book. I think I was, I'm particularly still intrigued in the question of how it's possible, uh, especially for a young person, to live a double life for so many years. And of course, uh, I think all Jews in the Soviet Union, and especially refusenik Jews, uh, led double lives. Uh, for children, this also meant that they had to learn the grammar of living uh, uh, on the surface as regular Soviet children and on uh, deeper levels as children of uh, refuseniks, of those who openly opposed the system, who challenged it, who fought uh, against the system uh, consciously as Jews. Uh, this also, this meant that uh, they had to figure out early on how to negotiate between these very different uh, lives uh, in the mainstream and in a very different community. And by that community, refuseniks were a community. Of course, there were tens of thousands of refuseniks in Moscow alone. They were, by the time I was a teenager, there were these morbid jokes that, you know, 20 years hence, there would be a second generation of refuseniks. Children of refuseniks would marry and they would have children. It would be a kind of community in internal exile that would even try to self-reproduce. These were morbid jokes, but that's, uh, they reflected the reality of our lives. But So I think, in other words, uh, growing up this way taught me a great deal about uh, modes of expression, about levels of discourse, and about the value of freedom. I think uh, these are not hollow words to me. I think uh, when I look at my children who are growing up, uh, 
uh, here uh, in Boston, who are going in Brookline, who are going to public schools, surrounded by children of many backgrounds, creeds, uh, and when I look at how they freely they express themselves without having to account for the kinds of things that I always had to account for as a young as a child and a young person, I really feel that uh, uh, I have. Uh, quite a bit of perspective on the value of uh, being able to express one's identity fully. In the Soviet Union, there was always the question of uh, having to hold back, to withhold portions, segments of one's identity.